Hi, welcome to Unit 7, Bacteria of Selected Systems. This is a unit where you are going to combine some of your previous knowledge and ap apply it to the identification and um, isolation of specific, three specific groups of bacteria. So we are going to focus on bacteria of the skin, bacteria of the respiratory tract, and here we are actually adding also oral bacteria and enterics. And for each of these groups, we are going to look at the structure of that particular area and the conditions that allow or um, influence how microbes grow there. We are going to look at some of the normal microbiota, and then we will focus on specific major players that can cause infections. So let's get started with the skin. The uh, diagram here shows the structure of the skin, kind of an, an overall view. Um, so there are two major regions in the skin. We have the epidermis, which is the outer layer, and the dermis. And the epidermis has, the, has multiple layers of tightly packed cells. They are mostly keratinocytes. And the outermost layer is actually a layer of dead cells containing keratin, which is a waterproof protein. So the skin is, uh, this outermost layer specifically, is a very effective uh, protective layer. And in, in, in addition to the layers and this outermost keratinized layer, it also has chemical defenses. For example, the uh, sweat on the surface of the skin um, provides a salty environment. There are going to be uh, lipid, fatty substances being secreted by the sebaceous gland, and also there is a certain acidity to the surface of the skin. Now, of course, if you have a wound on the skin, that will allow the um, invasion or entrance and invasion of microbes. So that's why a wound care is so important because even a very small wound can allow very dangerous bacteria to enter. Underneath the epidermis, we have the dermis, which is very different from the epidermis in the sense that you, do, you have a much, let's say, um, looser structure. So instead of those tightly packed cellular layers, you have a variety of cell types and structures embedded in a large amount of connective tissue. So this is where you are going to find blood vessels, nerves, hair follicles, adipose tissue, sebaceous gland, sweat glands, and so on. And then you have all this matrix in between. And what happens is that if microbes are able to enter into the dermis, particularly through wounds, then they can invade, uh, particularly using enzymes that break down um, collective, connective tissue. So you may have heard the word cellulitis. In the clinical sense, this refers to the um, inflammation of this connective tissue. It's very typical what you would see, let's say, in the case of flesh-eating bacteria, necrotizing fasciitis. You have a, a wound, which can be, again, very minor, but then you have this spreading redness, which indicates um, invasion of the, um, the bacteria in this connective tissue, and it can spread very quickly and cause very serious uh, infections. <clears throat> When we look at the normal microbiota of the skin, it's a little bit like this, um, you know, ecosystems. Um, so depending on the conditions of the, uh, of the skin, and you know, the, the skin on your face is very different, let's say, from the skin in the, in the middle of your back. So there are areas that are moister, there are areas that are drier, and there are areas that are more sebaceous, which means it has more... Um, fatty substances on it. And this slide shows some of the uh, most common uh, groups that can be found as different e uh, ecological areas. Uh, we are going to find some of them anaerobic, which can be deeper in the hair follicles. Others can be aerobic, occupying the uh, skin surfaces. And again, there are a large number of perfectly fine non-pathogenic 
uh, bacteria on the skin which are either commensals or mutualistic so either they benefit um, the organisms or they are just uh, sitting there not doing much but some of them can become pathogenic and we are going to look at them in a moment um, this is just to illustrate what we were talking about the um, uh, di different ecological regions of the skin so um, these little circles kind of show the diversity of the uh, the microbial um, population living on the skin and some of them you can see that are very um, I would say non-diverse they may have one or two major groups and then you have some groups that are very um, diverse and they tend to be more of the moister region so you can see um, regions such as the molar forum the antecubital fossa um, and other areas of the skin which are going to present a high variety of microbes um, and just reminding you about these factors so the ph of the skin tends to be slightly acidic the moisture can change depending on the areas um, those exposed to the sunlight or means that they are exposed also to uv radiation you may recall that uv radiation although non-ionizing and non-penetrating but it still can cause dna damage um, we talked about the saltiness which means that those bacteria that are able to live in salty environments remember halophiles um, are able to live in on the skin and those who can't uh, will not be able to to live there um, you may recall when we talked about the cell wall structure an enzyme called lysozyme lysozyme attacks the peptidoglycan cell wall so in a way it's almost like a natural penicillin so lysozyme is also present in uh, some body secretion particularly your skin so this is also a defense mechanism and the sebum you know the fatty secretions produced by sebaceous gland can also contain substances that are antimicrobial so let's talk about staphylococci so staphylococci are one of the most common uh, microbial groups on the skin i remind you that they are gram positive cocci that grow in um, grape-like clusters staphylococcus arrangements they are catalase positive and then they can have some differences and here we are bringing two major representatives of kind of a nasty earth so staphylococcus aureus although it is a normal uh, part of the microbiota the skin microbiota but it can acquire pathogenic potential it can acquire antibiotic resistant and if it penetrates into the body then it can cause extremely serious problem so versus staphylococcus epidermidis which is let's say a benign type of staphylococcus from the skin so the two differences here is the um, ability to ferment mannitol which is a sugar and also the presence or not of an enzyme called coagulase and this is something you have seen before so mannitol salt agar is a selective differential media particularly for gram positive cocci such as the ones on the skin so the salt content is a selective factor because again facultative halophiles uh, such as staphylococci are able to grow in the presence of salt and many others will not and the, the differential part is given by the presence of mannitol so staph aureus is able to ferment mannitol which will show us a yellow color on the plate and epidermidis is a non-fermenter so the plate will remain reddish pink uh, you may recall catalase so catalase is a very simple test it's just adding um, hydrogen peroxide to the culture it can be done in a slide it can be done in a broth um, if the um, cells contain catalase they are able to break down hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen and that shows us bubbles 
and um, all staph are catalase positive and that is different from streptococci. So we are going to see that in the next <clears throat> section that this is a very simple way to differentiate staph from strep. And you may also recall when we talk about catalase that it can also differentiate between two major groups of gram-positive rods. So bacilli and clostridia, bacilli are catalase positive and clostridia are catalase negative. Now coagulase is an enzyme that causes the um, fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is the precursor of the fibrin fire, uh, fibers <clears throat> that form blood clots. So coagulase um, make this fibrinogen to, to clot, uh, forming like a cocoon, like a protective barrier of fibrin around cells, which then protects the cells against phagocytosis and other immune responses. So the presence of coagulase is um, one of these mechanisms of evasion of the immune system. So Staph aureus is coagulase positive and Staph epidermidis is coagulase negative. How you test it, there is a um, reagent called um, coagulase plasma. So you add it and if it's positive, then you're going to have this um, clumpiness or kind of more solid structure versus a, uh, the negative reaction, which just stays liquid. And if you know those basic uh, reactions, then you are going to understand like the more advanced technologies. So there are multiple test systems. There is a company called Biomirieu, which has this API system. These are multiple test systems. So you have a strip of a number of reactions. And so you can do, as you can see in the, in the picture here, like when 20 different kind of reactions. And they can be... Um, tailored to different types of microbes. So they have many API systems, but there is one called API staff. And once you do these reactions, so you kind of read the reactions, and um, I don't think this is a, um, I think this is an enteric API 20E. So this is an enteric strip, but in the case of the um, the staff, it would look the same, just with different reactions. So for example, on the right hand side, you can see glue, man, ino, etc. Those are sugars, glucose, mannitol, inositol, and so on. Um, in the middle, you can see the VP reaction, the indole reaction, urea, H2S, the blue one is citrate, and so on. So all those biochemical reactions that you learned a few <clears throat> units ago can be done in one strip, which will give you the reactions in a few hours. And then based on those reactions, you will get the number. You kind of read the reaction, assign a point number, the, you know, depending on is it negative, is it positive, that will give you a code. And then you go to a database, which is called the EpiWeb, and um, um, look up that code to see to which microbe is, does it correspond. Okay, let's move on to the next part, which is the bacteria of the respiratory tract. And again, here we are going to look at both respiratory tract and also oral bacteria. So the respiratory tract, we can divide it into the upper and the lower respiratory tracts, which is, um, you know, the nose and the throat is the upper, which tends to be much more colonized with microbes. And then the lower respiratory, which will contain from the larynx and down all the way to the alveoli, is much, much cleaner. And there are a bit of um, contradictory information as are the lungs sterile. They are not really sterile. There's a bit of microbiota there, but it's very minimal compared to what you can find, let's say, in the throat. Um, there are a huge number of bacteria of different genera. You can find staph, you can find strep, Neisseria, Haemophilus, and so on. And we are going to focus in this section on streptococci. 
So um, streptococci, so these are gram-positive cocci which grow in, a, in chains. That's what the name tell, tells you. And they are gram-positive but catalase negative. And this corresponds to their aerotolerant um, character. You may recall that aerotolerant microbes can live without oxygen. They don't mind the oxygen. They don't care. They are the ones that grow uh, completely uniformly across, let's say, a tile glycolate broth or a deep. Now, how do you identify streptococcal species? So, for starters, if you have a gram-positive <clears throat> caucus, very, it's very easy to do a catalase test. And then, again, if it's catalase negative, that is a strong indication that it is a streptococcus. But there are many groups of streptococci. So, um, hemo hemolysis reactions, so how they, their ability or not to break down red blood cells is one of the most common ways to characterize them. And also you are going to see some additional tests. So um, blood agar is a medium in which it's red because it contains sheep red blood cells. And some bacteria are unable, so I'm going to start from the bottom, are unable to break down red blood cells, so you're not going to see any change in the blood agar around the colony. We call it gamma hemolysis or no hemolysis. When they are able to break down the red blood cells, they can do it either partially or completely. So they are in, actually, let me go and show it in the next slide. So to the left, you see beta hemolysis. So this is a complete breakdown of the red blood cells, and you can observe it as a clear heal halos around the colonies. Um, alpha hemolysis in the middle, it's an incomplete partial hemolysis. So it's going to break down some of the red blood cells, but not completely, which then shows us a greenish tinge around the colonies. But you see that you cannot see, you cannot observe that completely clear halos around the colonies. Um, and just going back for a second, um, what is nastier, of course, beta hemoly hemolysis is a more, it's a harsher effect on red blood cells. It's breaking down the red blood cells completely. So for that reason, uh, beta hemolytic streptococci are very often pathogenic. They cause diseases in contrast to the alpha and gamma hemolytic streptococci. And again, you have tons of streptococci in your throat that are perfectly normal. There is a word which is called uh, streptococcus viridens, and this is not a taxonomic um, concept. This is not an official denomination, but a lot of clinical microbiologists still use that group. Um, you are going to look at streptococcus pneumonia in a second. It's an alpha hemolytic one, but then streptococcus viridans are those that are alpha hemolytic but different from strep pneumonia. And again, this is one of those, um, how you say that, um, left behind um, traditional words, but it's not really a, a scientific word to describe streptococci. And um, Group A streptococci, there we have strep pyogenes. And strep pyogenes, the name pyogenes means that provokes or makes pus. And this is the streptococcus that causes strep throat and a number of other very serious streptococcal infections. So in general, strep pyogenes is your worst streptococcus. Now, um, this is a very simple kind of overview of how can you classify streptococci. So you have the hemolysis part, alpha, beta, and gamma. But then there is a classification called the Lance field. It's, it's here in the last uh, uh, line. So Lance field was a microbiologist, and she described 
uh, different antigens that were present on streptococci, which allow them to be classified in different groups. So we, we have a number of uh, streptococcus groups. So here, the only ones that you can see is A and B, but there are, I think, all the way till F or G. And um, this has changed, you know, there have been adaptation, but people still talk about uh, gas, G-A-S, that is group A streptococci, which is an, the nasty one, this is pyogenes. And then you have GBS, which are the group B streptococci, which is less nasty than pyogenes, but it's still, that can still cause very serious infections. Um, <clears throat> And um, in some medical practices, you can find rapid tests. For example, if uh, a child has a very serious throat infection, just to figure out if they have strep throat. So those are, those are immune, immunological reactions to quickly identify one of those. But we are going a little bit now in the traditional route. So we already mentioned pyogenes and agalactiae, which belong to the beta hemolytic one. And then the alpha hemolytic, what I was saying, um, we have strep pneumonia, which is uh, alpha, so it's a partial hemolysis, and then everybody else, which is kind of uh, grouped into this very dense group. And gamma hemolytic ones are belong to the enterococci, and enterococci used to be called before a type of streptococci, but they are now named differently. Okay, so again, you do your blood agar, you look at hemolysis patterns, and then some additional um, tests, for example, are uh, sensitivity to certain antibiotics. So there are two antibiotics that are used. For example, bacitracin, strep pyogenes, is sensitive to bacitracin. Everybody else is resistant to bacitracin. Conversely, strep pneumonia is sensitive to optokin. It's another uh, antibiotic, and which is uh, the opposite for the other. So again, bacitracin and optokin sensitivity are very useful to differentiate strep pneumonia from strep pyogenes, although they also remember one is alpha and the other is beta hemolytic. Um, biosolubility. So bio salts are basically like detergents. So if you add bio salts to a broth, um, some bacteria will basically disintegrate and others not. So strep pneumonia um, is sensitive to biosalt, biosalts, while the other alpha hemolytic ones are not. And this is just an illustration of how you, um, you know, test for the um, uh, antibiotic sensitivity. So to the left, strep pyogenes, you see the, there's a disc with bacitracin and there's a clearness around it, and you can also clearly see the beta hemolytic pattern versus to the right strep pneumonia, alpha hemolysis, the greenish colonies, and then a halo around optican. A special case is oral bacteria. So there are a huge number of bacteria in the mouth, and a lot of them are streptococci, which are in this uh, alpha hemolytic viridens. Um, streptococci that we mentioned before. We have very normal ones such as uh, streptomyces, strep salivarius, but then there is also streptococcus mutans, which is one of the responsible uh, bacteria for dental decay. Um, that beautiful blue medium you see to the right is called the metis salivarius agar. So the, um, I think it's uh, just a violet, um, so the dye in it is, makes it selective for streptococci. And then the colony morphology and the color is different for different kinds of oral bacteria. So for example, the um, uh, strep mutants has this frosted glass colony appearance. 
um, to the right, for example, you can see that um, there are additional tests. You don't need to know the details about this, just that there are a number of sugars that, depending on the pattern of fermentation, you can, um, you know, there are tables that will allow you to differentiate different oral streptococci, and then in addition, streptococcus mutans is resistant to bacitracin, which is what's showing in the picture to the right. Um, also, when you obtain a throat culture, um, you have to go deep, what we call the golden arches in the throat, and um, you are going to inoculate on a blood agar plate, again, because the hemolysis pattern is going to give you a lot of information on what kind of bacteria are in your throat. Um, you start with a swab, because obviously you're going to swab your throat with a swab, not with a loop. So you uh, start your uh, streak plate with a swab, and then you discard the swab, you grab the loop, uh, flame it, etc., and then you re the remainder of the plate, you streak it the usual way. Okay, and the last group we are going to look at are the Enterobacteriaceae, or also called Enterics. So as the name indicates, these are common in the GI system. They are gram-negative, oxidase-negative rods. They tend to be facultative anaerobes, and there are a huge number of them. E. coli is one of the most common, but we have here also Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Citrobacter, Klebsiella, um, Enterobacter, many, many others. Um, selective differential media are very common as a first step. They tend to be selective for gram negatives. You may recall McConkie and the EMB agar for a few um, units ago. Um, the picture on the right is the hectoin enteric agar, is very kind of pretty green one. And all these media also tend to have a differential uh, character. So you may recall that both McConkie and EMB looked for fermentation of lactose. In the case of hectoin and enteric, you combine fermentation also with H2S production. So sometimes uh, you get these black colonies, which are indicated, for example, Salmonella is able to, um, um, to produce H2S. Um, going back to the biochemical test, you may recall the INVIC test panel, which uh, includes the indoor production, method red, Volk proscrower test, and citrate uh, production on Simmons uh, slant. You may want to go back and revisit what, you know, what those tests are and what do they test for and how, how do you interpret them. So here you can actually see very nicely the uh, the different positive and negative tests. And I believe in that um, slide, or so th th those slides, there was a table, but it's kind of the similar table here. So some of the uh, very common examples of uh, enterobacteria here, E. coli, Proteus, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter. So by using this test, you can differentiate one from the other. And similar to the API, which by the way, API also have an enteric panel. Um, these, this is another commercial system. It's called the Enterotube. Uh, same thing. It's a, uh, it has 12 compartments with different biochemical tests. In, um, it's different from the API. The API system is broth base, so you'll be adding broth to the wells. Here, um, I believe there is a video of it. Um, basically, in the middle, through the middle, runs like a long wire. And you get that wire out, you take your colony, and then you kind of push it through that this whole 12 compartments, so you're inoculating those 12 compartments at the same time, you will be um, incubating it, and that way, um, you know, you can read the reactions later on. So this is a one-step um, system, but again, if you look at the, uh, at the diagram here, you will see many of the um, 
reactions that you already know. You can see glucose, you can see mannitol, lactose, uh, VP, um, citrate, and so on. So this is a one-step way to analyze enterics. And with this, um, we uh, finish the uh, lecture for Unit 7. Thank you.